Walker. This is Jade Whitty. I'm a solutions practice consultant with Tech Data. And on the line, as usual, I've got Brett Scott and Josh Harp, who are two ethical hackers that are in the trenches every day, um, working with um, on different projects with our government and military, and uh, who definitely are in the know on cybersecurity. So today's topic is about something that's very, very popular in the discussions right now is deep learning. And I'm going to turn it over to Josh to kind of tee this up because of what we're hearing in the talk amongst the hacker community. So take it away, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Jade. So um, just quickly, at summer conferences where, such as DEF CON and Black Hat, and people within the cybersecurity community have seen about 100% increase uh, around key terms and key phrases such as data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in the past, um, we know from different vendors that um, machine learning and AI, uh, artificial intelligence has been something that they've started to incorporate into their solutions. Um, in terms of specifics for what is artificial intelligence, we look at it as an umbrella term um, that specifically talks about forms of intelligence exhibited by machines. So a good idea of, of what this might be to think about in the back of your mind is going to be IBM's Watson. Another example of this might be a, um, a Twitter bot that Microsoft put out named Tay, um, which is no longer out there, but that's beside the point. Um, and then inside of artificial intelligence, there are different learning concepts or ways that machines can gain this intelligence factor. One is machine learning, which is specifically driven um, by humans and requires a human intervention um, for teaching the machine how to interpret different forms of data. Uh, one of the ways that people talk about this is specifically in relation to feature extraction. So um, what are the most common things that are um, being encountered? And then you also have something that's a newer term, not new in the sense of uh, a new field or groundbreaking form of study, but something that has been around but now is just being incorporated into different security solutions would be deep learning, um, which doesn't require any form of human intervention and can simply interpret the raw data and, and learn from it. So. Uh, certain examples that we've given, which we can show later, um, is a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com, which uses a form of um, a sub form of machine of deep learning called gains, and we can go into what that is um, briefly without having to go too deep in the weeds. And then state of the art autonomous self driving cars. So one of the big concerns people have had around AI is that AI is going to replace jobs. Um, in relation to cybersecurity, there are people out there who advocate for AI taking over the typical security analyst role. Um, but all of that being said, there is still um, there are still caveats, and we don't really, in our day-to-day -day live, experience true forms of AI. We experience pseudo forms of AI, which could be easily referred to as Siri or Alexa, right? Um, so that is a real brief overview in regards to kind of what we'll go over on the call. Um, Brett, did you have something to add? Well, you gave a great overview. And uh, these types of concepts are in and around us and have been for some time. Uh, what is advancing is that there seems to be more focus on trying to provide niche solutions similar to what was done with Watson and the chess tournament and playing against humans. When you uh, begin the hyper focus in a specific area, you get a higher yield. What are what are some of the limitations um, of machine learning, and why deep learning is kind of ca catching on? And I, I know it just a few years ago, it there was some concern if it was really going to catch on, but it has, and there's been some breakthroughs in technology. But what are some of the, the limitations of machine learning that deep learning is, is addressing? So I, I can take that. So machine learning, um, like like I mentioned, is primarily, there, there are two types of 
uh, models that you can use in machine learning, supervised and unsupervised models. And this is all around the feature extraction principle that we talked about. And so in relation to cybersecurity, people are using supervised and unsupervised models to identify different forms of attack. So again, this goes back to needing a domain expert to infer the context of the data and tune an algorithm um, for it to get better results. So in for, if we're talking about malware specifically, the way machine learning and deep learning would differ is that in machine learning, the malware, um, the, the domain expert would have to decompile, go through the malware, figure out what are the switches, what is, what, what's, what is the triggers, what are those items that it can specifically say, okay, start to recognize this pattern and report um, that it is going to be uh, an issue for you. Whereas um, something more in the form of deep learning, when you're looking at malware that's constantly being developed by nation states and there are many cybersecurity solutions are failing and struggling to even detect new malware. Um, and you also have the f different forms of malware that can easily evade uh, detection of sophisticated cybersecurity solutions. You have where deep learning is able to say uh, and start to move past uh, language barriers, uh, program programmatic methods, and start to just be able to determine what anomalies are going on when, let's say, malware is detonated. It doesn't need a domain expert to train it to determine what the triggers are. It can just begin to learn by it receiving and feeding in large data sets. Brett, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so <clears throat> deep learning is essentially the nature of it is more observational and it is less likely to be uh, biased through uh, inadequate data sets or uh, somehow a human's bias injected into the data set. So I'll give you a classic example. Let's say that uh, you want to identify cats in a photograph. And so the person who is training the algorithm loves a Siamese cat, maybe has a friend who has a great cat. And so they take a whole bunch of pictures of the Siamese cat and they're like, hey, this is, this is, hey machine, this is what a cat is. And then of course, when that algorithm has been looking at all kinds of cats, calicos and all the other types of cats that are out there, it will have a difficult time recognizing things that anyone would recognize as a cat because its data set was mostly Siamese cats. So it's going to say, well, I see this thing, but I'm not so sure it's a cat because, you know, it doesn't really match up my data set. So that bias is something that we as humans are constantly introducing many times without even knowing that we're doing it. I think it's safe to say that most people that are experimenting with AI uh, and machine learning really do not understand the data science behind it. And so there it's, so, uh, it's you know, giving a five-year-old a machine gun. It, it, God only knows what's going to happen when you, when you set it off. So you, you really need to make sure that, um, that as you are using these technologies, you're using them in the best possible way with the least amount of bias being introduced. And there are some uh, pretty funny stories that we in the cyber range have found as a result of our experience with these particular technologies. Yeah, such as, give us an example. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that uh, that these types of uh, algorithms have been used for is facial recognition. Uh, so we had a project that uh, allowed us to uh, pick up all the faces and the people that were visiting us, and we were essentially trying to do a project to prove the value or the, the, the risks of using a facial recognition technology. And what was uh, kind of funny to us was, you know, we had thousands of people that we had picked up from the visitor, visitors to our cyber range, and uh, at one point, we found the picture, and it was a, it was essentially a white picture with a couple of shading on it. And we, we were looking at this and going, how on earth did this get recognized as a face? Uh, and then uh, upon careful examination, we realized that um, it, even though it was a white T-shirt and the picture was of someone's torso, the unique combination of lighting and shading made it look like a face. And so just like you see, you know, things in the clouds, uh, a, a camera and a algorithm behind it saw the T-shirt and the particular shading and, and lighting on it as a face. And so it captured that. And of course, 
that's something where ML, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence will fail because it will say, hey, wait a minute, I just matched my data set and it's proportionate and everything's right. Whereas something like deep learning would say, well, that seems to match, but uh, faces are not usually the size of a human torso. So it would be able to parse out that false positive in that particular case. And that's just one, one example. Right. So that, what, I, think what that's a, I think that's an right. excellent explanation because it shows how these forms of using and devoting most of machine learning to that feature extraction results in uh, losing different forms of data, right? So in his example of a cat, you're, using, you're losing many different other uh, types or subspecies of cats. You're missing the subtle interactions. So what distinguishes um, the difference or the patterns um, within that? And then you're ultimately arriving at or getting a one particular format at a time. Interesting. Um, what do you feel are some of the challenges or hurdles that we're, uh, we're dealing with in implementing deep learning in cybersecurity? So we, we get that there's some benefits to it. Um, and I know it's in the early stages. There's some companies that are claiming to be leveraging it. And I know we're going to see more and more as this continues to gain momentum. What are some of the, the hurdles that you guys are, are seeing? Brett, you want to take the first stab at that? Not a problem. So one of the biggest hazards uh, with the hype that goes along with these technologies is the thought or the suggestion in many cases that this technology essentially replaces human beings. And um, that is something where uh, it's not going to happen. It, we have, um, at the Cyber Rangers, we've had a tremendous amount of experience and exposure to all of the very advanced stuff. I personally have experience with these technologies going back to 1995. Um, and the, and the, the suggestion that this somehow cuts into your headcount is intended to be deceitful, I think, because uh, in reality, the, the, the optimal uh, potential benefit is that you would be able to cut out some of your entry level positions uh, if you're in a SOC, for example, you might be able to cut one or two level one technicians because the ML or the AI or even the DO could handle the ticket closures for certain cases and things like that. Honestly, you could do the same thing with orchestration. So uh, this is something where you will never be able to replace higher order thinking with these technologies, not at least for another 20 years. Uh, we, we go through the research, we talk to all the scientists, we, we know who these people are, we see what they're working on. And the fact is, is that uh, it is simply, uh, it, it's, it's almost a sense of, of uh, scientific arrogance to assume that you could have computer algorithms replace high order thinking in humans. That being said, there is some opportunity to take down the noise level. Anybody in cybersecurity is crazy busy all the time and the volume of data and things that they're being their attention is being distracted to is usually above human ability so having tools like orchestration like these three technologies you know uh, artificial intelligence machine learning deep learning they are uh, helpers if you will that help to reduce the noise level so that humans can focus on the stuff that, that humans are really good at so that's where it value is. The greatest promise, I think, is in the deep learning set because you don't have to train it. Therefore, you have less hazard of human bias uh, altering the data set. And therefore, you do not have a, 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 in the hacker world, we call confirmation bias, where it only sees this one thing because that's all it was ever trained to do. And it doesn't see any of the other things that are also as dangerous, but because it wasn't trained to, it doesn't. So deep learning is great because it has, essentially you're giving power to the algorithm to make its own assumptions. And I think that's going to be very, very helpful going forward. But uh, it's a very difficult path, and that's that's why you really need expertise when implementing these technologies. Yeah. So I, I think that what what to sum it up in about two sentences, what you're really saying is the human element of creativity and ingenuity is always going to be existential to both the hacker and the defender. So that meaning our human way of solving problems is always going to reign over the future of artificial intelligence, machine learning, or deep learning. Um, 
I think a lot of these solutions come from an area in cybersecurity where there's frequent career burnout and analysts just are receiving so much data over time that it's very hard to parse through it. So as Brett mentioned, reducing a lot of that overhead is in the ability of um, deep learning to be able to say and work in collaboration with analysts, hey, this nasty thing is going on and drive more into what it might be as well as in terms of uh, threat actors and APTs tra tra changing their techniques, tactics, and procedures in different forms and malware classes, you're able to now have a system that can recognize those changes or those differences and patterns and be able to not necessarily attribute more effectively, but be able to prevent it before it occurs. It's, it's, a, it's a technology I think many organizations would have liked to have had before a lot of the big malware attacks of 2017, like WannaCry, Not Pietcha, and all all those. And the thing is, is because we're coming off the cusp of that, and it's such a hot topic, a lot of people look at it as a silver bullet solution. Um, but at the end of the day, and until something is fully trained and has gone through and understood what's happening right, you're at a point of still relying on the human element, and you always will be um, because of the fact that uh, humans have a creative and ingenious in way of solving issues. Um, so I want to I open it up with if anyone on the call has any questions on this. Um, and if you're if you don't have one immediately be thinking out, I want to just um, I want to just ask if we could kind of dive into the difference between machine learning and deep learning with the examples that we have. We have Syracon, which is, you know, um, our recon priority solution um, here at Tech Data, and it's it's using machine learning. Talk talk through how that is um, why that's machine learning, not deep learning, and then also let's touch on that site. This person does not exist and how that is deep learning. Yeah, so why Syracon is machine learning is simply, it's taking in different in indicators within the deep, deep and dark web. Uh, hacker discussions have reputation better that a specific vulnerability um, is being discussed and it's putting it into an algorithm which then ultimately determines its priority rating, so to say, that I have thousands of vulnerabilities that I know I need to patch. Um, and it and it's instead of a risk-based model, it's looking at a threat-based model, so to speak, who out of those thousands of vulnerabilities you have, if we can get down to 10 and determine which are most frequently involved in hacker discussions, which hackers with great reputation are talking about it, and what vendor is it in, um, impacting, they are able to then determine what the priority in your patch management process should be. So again, it's a human who's looked at these different hacker discussions, who's determined the, um, the reputability of the hacker. It's, it's the uh, human who's looked into who the vendors are and then has given it an algorithm to say, take in all of that data and now tell me what the score should be for that. Um, Brett, do you have uh, anything additional to add to, to CyberCon's specific solution? Yeah, and, and like, um, like all of these things, they are prone to uh, following or chasing a rabbit down a hole. Um, so if, uh, if there was some sort of ongoing running joke amongst the hacker community where they would all talk about something that may have been solved, I mean, I, uh, believe it or not, I was just contacted by a major university uh, considered one of the innovative leaders in the country, and they were wanting to uh, to install uh, Windows 95 machines and uh, demonstrate the denial of service vulnerability, which has been remediated for the last 20 years. And so, if people uh, then look at that, that they're proposing a project that quite literally is is 20 years too old, uh, and then start joking about it, like, oh, I can't believe these guys, they were working at CB, da 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 da, da. all of that discussion, all that chatter, if you will, would tend to bias the algorithm. And so it would push up the severity level of a particular thing, which has no severity at all. That thing has been solved for 20 years. So uh, it, they are prone to those types of uh, misdirection. 
Uh, although uh, the contemplation of looking at it with no help whatsoever, not exactly appealing either. So everything that you do must be taken with a grain of salt, and that's true of even solutions like CyberCon. So essentially what you would be saying is, uh, outside of receiving the report to say prioritize based on these elements, you would also say go back and see what the trigger was to determine that because if you with the human eye recognize a pattern of people within forums or different groups of hackers joking about a particular vulnerability or, or CVE that goes back a long way, you're able to now recognize that that item you thought was highly prioritized actually is not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, that just really kind of speaks to the, the ultimate nature of especially machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, you will not be replacing humans with that. And no algorithm of those two categories will ever be savvy to things that we consider to be funny uh, as part of a discussion of a very serious topic, which is cybersecurity. Awesome. So, Jade, would you mind opening this person does not exist dot com in a browser and putting that up for everyone? Yeah, I can. Um, when your end partners are talking about uh, implementing these technologies, you need to have people that understand these principles pretty deeply, and that's exactly where you can uh, you can rely upon tech data and our team of expertise to walk you through the process and maybe even work with the end customer and you to help them find the solution that best fits their environment because it also is subjective to the environment which they're currently operating. Uh, there's no such thing as putting something in and it totally changes everything that's going on. Everything has to be done in the context of what else is running within that network. So, Josh, once you walk us through this, this is a little freaky. <laughs> that, was that was all right. That's the first major fail I've seen. That's pretty good. So, um, these, as this URL might tell you and be an indicator of, um, these people don't actually exist. So, <laughs> these are um, simply, uh, it, it is a form of, of deep learning uh, AI where you're using uh, generative adversarial networks um, to take in both images that are fake and real, uh, pin them against each other in terms of attempting to generate something that is new or a different image. So, I mean, in, in this example, you can see there, there's a little discrepancy in the bottom left, so it's not fully accurate in, in determining a picture of a human. but all of these images have been generated by this form of GANs. And so GANs came out around for the first time in 2014. Again, like I mentioned, their goal was to synthesize artificial samples such as images that are indistinguishable from authentic images. Um, so the per most, most applications of gains are in this area of generating artificial face images by learning from a data set of celebrity faces. So someone's taken a whole large data set of celebrity faces, put it into the gain, and then ultimately you get similar results to this. Um, what are the potential implications of this? Well, I mean, you can have people who have fake profiles within social networks who have leveraged the images that have been discovered on here to make you think as though you're interacting with someone um, that is real. That one's pretty scary. Uh, obviously, that didn't work out well. Uh, another example of how they're using this is they're using it in the form of technology-driven artwork. Um, so, one of the things Jade and I had been uh, looking at in preparation for this uh, this call um, was different forms of gains in, in, in deep learning and how it all works and what it means. And we had found that uh, some researchers, I think it was out of France, go figure, all right, had taken a form of generative adversarial networks and, and created a painting. And that painting sold, what was the figure, like $40,000 or something like that, 40 grand yeah. or something? Um, because, you know, we could either say, well, it's just that someone created artwork that was new and it was technology driven and that was awesome and someone wanted to have it in their house, or um, because the artwork was indistinguishable from other artworks within the same era of 
or, or a period of time. So what they were doing was they were taking artwork um, back from, I don't know, was it the 1900s or something, and then using it to now generate a new form of artwork. And there were parallels as if the artwork that was generated was from another individual who was painting art in that same period of time. So these are just different. The purpose of this is just to show an example of how uh, within deep learning you have gains, um, general adversarial networks, which is pinning different systems of data sets against each other to determine what might be real and what is fake. But in this example, they're just generating fake images of, of individuals or people um, that you might think you can meet on the street. <laughs> I, I like this because it's also reverse of of the uh, of the value prop, right? And in most of the cases in cybersecurity, it's going to be these algorithms will find something. It will it will it will notice and detect something. Whereas this uh, the, the, the space does not exist. This person does not exist. Quite literally, is uh, the reverse of that, where the algorithms are making something fake. So I love it because it really, you, by using both uh, the, the poles, if you will, to examine what's going on in the middle, you get a better idea of how it works. And most people will say, this, these are very convincing spaces. Uh, but by the same token, um, you, you're not gonna find any of these people. Which is the creepy thing about it. <laughs> Josh and I were looking at this and it's, when you realize that that face does, that's not actually a person. <laughs> I don't know, it was a little bit um, dis um, disconcerting. <laughs> well, I, as, a hacker, as a hacker, I would want to make an online dating service where it just generates pictures like this and put phone numbers next to them and see how often people call those phone numbers. <laughs> Interesting. All right, well, um, any other, any questions from anyone else on the call? I know we're getting close to needing to wrap it up. All right. Well, it sounds like um, I really appreciate uh, Josh and Brett and all the um, your you being on this call and the prep work that you guys did um, prior to this. So um, thanks for everyone that was on the call and uh, we'll talk to you guys next month.